Just a note on this recording, uh, for reasons that are unclear to me, the audio did not work at the beginning and the end of the lecture. So I re-recorded just the very opening and the final few minutes of the lecture. So if the sound sounds funny, that's what's going on. Okay, so this is our first substantial class. The first class where we do some content and we're just gonna look at the concept of validity and do a few examples today. Before we get going, uh, I wanna make a note on the Logic 2010 website. Unfortunately, uh, the people who run it have not yet set up our course. So you can, you can install the program but you can't yet register for this course. And it has to, you have to register for the 2019 version at U of T with me as the professor in order to get credit. So hang on, don't do anything about that yet. There's nothing that you need to do on that until next week. So with any luck, it'll be set up by then. The good news is there's nothing you have to do on Logic 2010 this week. It's not until next week that we even begin to need it. Uh, if in the, I think, unlikely event that we haven't got this set up by next week, the solution will be generosity. That is uh, two things. So I'm posting these exercises every Monday. So starting next week, there'll be one of these exercises posted Monday uh, to be submitted by Saturday of the next week. Uh, if we don't have this set up by Monday, you'll start to get extensions on this week's exercises. If we don't have it set up by like the middle of next week, uh, we're just gonna give you all the marks for this exercise and I'll post pen and paper versions of it so you can you get the practice and you get the marks. Uh, that's less than ideal from my perspective because I'd like to be able to diagnose whether you're actually doing it or not, but that's the position we'll be in if this isn't set up by then. I expect that it will be. I hope to hear from this guy any, any day now, but these are, the, these are the problems of using frankly, free software that's provided to us out of the generosity of like one dude's heart. Uh, that's why we get to use this software is because it's just a guy who's running this for many, many institutions. So that's where we're at. I will update you as soon as I hear anything further. Uh, questions about that? Okay. So uh, one other thing that I've been hearing a bunch of questions about a number of people have come up and asked me, hey, I don't see this course on Quarkus. I'm signed up, I'm enrolled, I don't see this course on Quarkus. So the solution is the following. So you wanna to go to the courses section in this, in this blue column on the left, you go to courses and you click all courses. Under all courses, you'll have a list of like every course you've ever done in Quarkus. And only the ones that have got a star beside them show up on your dashboard. And you can either give a course a star or not by just clicking on it. And once it lights up, see now this tutorial from my class last year will be under my courses. So if you haven't got that orange star lit up beside this course, it won't show up on your dashboard. But if you just click on the star, then it will. So that's the, if you don't see this course on Quarkus, that's very likely what's wrong. Either that or you're not off the wait list yet, so. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. Any other questions about the kind of course structure stuff? You're all good. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly for you to have done yet. So I don't expect there to be too much confusion because there's nothing to be confused about. Okay. Good. Let's do some stuff you can be confused about then. All right, let's get going. Yay. Okay, so as we said last time, the topic of this course is basically arguments. Uh, but I don't, by argument, I don't mean when you and another person are yelling at each other. That's, I mean, that is a valid sense of the word argument, but that's not what an argument means in philosophy. An argument in philosophy means some ideas given as a reason to believe as justification for some other idea. Yeah, and so what we're gonna study are argument forms, which arguments work and which don't work. And specifically today we're gonna to talk about the concept of validity. Uh, so just a bit of nomenclature. A premise is the thing being given as a reason to believe the other thing. And the other thing 
is the conclusion. These are, this is language we'll use throughout the semester. So premises are reasons to believe something. They are offered as reasons to believe something. And you don't get to convince anybody of anything unless you agree on premises, right? The premises are supposed to be these common grounds. So suppose you and somebody else disagree about something. The, the rational strategy for convincing them is to find some premises that you agree about and then develop an inference from those premises to the conclusion which you disagree about, right? So premises are supposed to be the starting point of the argument and you make an inference from those premises to the conclusion. Yeah, this should be fairly straightforward. This should be, you probably heard of these things before in like your life. Yeah, okay. Now, logic is a normative discipline, right? Normative means it's about what's good and bad, right? So what, what we're doing here is trying to understand which arguments are good in a specific sense, in a very specific sense. So which arguments give us adequate reasons to believe the conclusion, yeah? And that's different, that's quite different than saying that it's likely to actually convince somebody of something. So if, if people were rational, completely perfectly rational, they would be convinced only by good arguments from reasonable evidence. I'm not going to shock you by telling you that people are not completely rational and reasonable. Yeah? People believe stuff for all kinds of reasons. People believe an argument if you say it in a big, loud voice. If you do the, the psychology of this. So as a matter of fact, if you talk loud, people believe you more. If you're tall, people believe you more. Uh, if you repeat something over and over again, people believe you more. But those aren't rational reasons for believing something, right? Those are irrational reasons for believing something. People are funny. We believe things for all kinds of reasons. But in this class, we're going to study arguments that it would be rational to believe. So to the extent that people are rational, you should believe arguments that are valid and have true premises. And we'll talk a lot about validity throughout the semester. So we mean by a good argument, logic is the science of arguments that would be completely convincing to completely rational people. Uh, I don't really know where you go in a university to study how to make people believe what you want them to believe. Marketing, I guess. Rhetoric, something like that. I don't, I don't really know. I'm a philosopher. I don't, I don't, we just say stuff and you believe it or you don't. Okay, so within the realm of good in the sense of rational, arguments, there are two broad categories. We're only going to be dealing with one of these. So you've got inductive arguments. An inductive argument is like the following. Aspirin cured my headaches in the past. Therefore, aspirin, aspirin will cure this headache. Right? So you take a sample of past events and you infer based on the pattern of past events what the future is likely to be like. Right? So that's a pretty good argument. It's not a terrible argument, right? Like it's a, it's a good reason for you to go ahead and take an aspirin because if it worked in the past, maybe it'll work in the future, but it's certainly not guaranteed to work in the future. So just because the past was one way is obviously not a guarantee that it's going to continue to be that way in the future. So inductive arguments have this property that even if the premises are true, the conclusion is not guaranteed to be true. It's more likely, it's more probable, you know, it's, it's worth a shot, but it's not guaranteed. Now compare that to the kind of argument on the right, the deductive argument. A deductive argument is defined in terms of the following property. If the premises of a deductive argument are true, the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. So all gold is metal. Uh, this is gold, therefore, this is metal. Okay, so if those first th two things are true, the third thing is guaranteed to be true. Now, I held up, when I said this, I held up this cardboard box that used to hold batteries. It's not true that this is gold. It's goldish, gold-colored, but it's not gold. Right? So 
But that's nonetheless, even if I'm referring, when I say this, even if I'm referring to this piece of cardboard, it's nonetheless a deductively valid argument, which tells you something about the concept of validity, which is something we're gonna unpack for the rest of this lecture, which is that validity doesn't guarantee truth. It's a kind of conditional guarantee. It says, if the premises are true, if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows with certainty. Now, this is not gold in the sense of gold, gold, right? Not in the sense of it's metal, it's cardboard. So the premise is not true. This is not gold. That doesn't mean it's not, a, that makes, a, it makes it a bad argument in the sense that it's not an argument you should accept. You should not accept that this is made of metal, right? I just told you it's cardboard. It doesn't make it a, not a deductive argument. So what we need to tease apart is this question of the relation between the premises that's what makes something a deductive argument or not, and being, a, being true. So that's the, the main business of today is to do that. So how do we know that the, our premises are true? So I'm gonna offer you in this course a whole bunch of things that I'm gonna call premises. And it's reasonable to ask, how do we know these premises are true? And my answer for the purposes of this course are, uh, who cares? We're not going to do that. We're not going to. We're not going to talk about how we find out whether a premise is true or false. That would be science or epistemology, right? More broadly, right? So we're going to just ignore the question of how do we know the premises are true, and really focus on the question of if the premises are true, what follows from that? Okay, so. One of the nice things about this course is that you don't need to know any facts about the world, right? You don't, know, you don't need to know whether anything is true or false. You can come here utterly empty-headed with nothing but a basic technical facility and do extremely well in the course. I think you know facts about the world, but that's just not gonna be a helpful skill for you here, okay? So we're ignoring the question of whether our premises are true, basically. Or how do, you, how do you know this premise is true? Where did you, what's your evidence? How did you figure this out? We don't care. That's not a, that's not a thing we're going to worry about. Okay? It's a bunch of stuff we're going to ignore in this course. A bunch of really important stuff we're going to ignore for the purposes of getting at the following. Deductive arguments are truth preserving. That's, that is to say, with a deductive argument, if, a, if an argument is properly deductive, you get out exactly much, as much truth as you put in. If you put in tr true premises, you are guaranteed to get out a true conclusion. Right? So the, being a deductive argument is being truth preserving. If you put false premises into a deductive argument, you might get a false conclusion out. That's not what's being guaranteed here. What's being guaranteed is that if you put in pr true premises, then you get a true conclusion out, right? So it's a, what we're learning about is these structural relations between premises and conclusions, not whether the premises are true or not. Okay. So, for the purposes of this course, validity means the following. This is straight out of the Parsons textbook. An argument is valid if and only if there is no logically possible situation in which all of its premises are true and its conclusion false. Okay. So that's a two-part definition. There are two parts to this definition of validity, and it's saying here there's no situation, there's no conceivable situation, there is no logically possible, and it's a very broad sense of possible, scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion's false. Okay, so let's explore this definition a bit because I know, I know I said this course was a series of purely technical skills, but you do have to understand a couple of bits of it in order to acquire those technical skills. So this is one of the things that basically we're spending this class trying to understand the concept of validity. So, okay. So that definition of validity ruled out only one of the following four situations. So, Suppose green means something is true, red means it's false, and those arrows are like there's an implication, right? So from premise, P, to conclusion, C. So 
three of those arguments, suppose each one of these vertical columns is an argument, three of those are potentially valid. Only one of them is ruled out by the definition of validity. Which one of those is not even a candidate for being a valid argument? Yeah. The second one, the second one from the left, where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. If you have an argument, if in any argument where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, that's an invalid argument for our purposes, right? It's an invalid argument. That's what we're trying to rule out. We're trying to rule out the scenario where you put in true premises and end up with a false conclusion. Now, the first thing on the very left is what you probably think of as a good argument. That's the kind of argument you want, right? You want ones with true premises and true conclusions. That's great, that's what you really want. But these two on the right are both at least potentially, so all we know about these is whether the premises are true or false. These are at least both potentially valid arguments. So I'm using valid in a weird technical way here. So usually you think of valid, you think of like good, nice, thing I want. But those two things on the right are potentially valid arguments. And let me show you some examples of things that satisfy that definition of validity that I just gave you, but are like this. So uh, this is what, I, what we just said. So a valid, argument can, a valid argument can have false premises. It's nothing, you know, it's not an argument that you want. You want to live in the land of truth and rationality or whatever, but for our definition of validity, an argument can have val false premises. A valid argument can have a false conclusion even if its premises are false. The only thing a valid argument can't have is true premises and a false conclusion. That's the combination that's ruled out. So our definition of validity rules out this combination of states of affairs. True premises, all true premises, and a false conclusion. So like, you know, the standard way of using the word valid is to mean like good and nice. In your life, what you want are what's called sound arguments. So we distinguish validity from soundness. And this is harder than it seems. Uh, a sound argument is a valid argument that has true premises. That's what you actually want in your actual life. Sound arguments. Arguments where if the premises are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed, and the premises are true. That's the desirable situation. But because in this course, we're kind of ignoring the question of like, how do you know the premises are true? We're not really going to worry about soundness that much, right? We're really going to be focusing on validity. So here's an argument that is invalid, but has true premises and a true conclusion. It is January. Check. It's totally January. I am wearing shoes. Check. I am wearing shoes. Therefore, it is daytime. It's daytime. It's totally daytime. So two true premises and a true conclusion. But are those premises a guarantee of the truth of the conclusion? Like, could it, be Jan could it be the case that it's January and I'm wearing shoes, but it's not daytime? Can you imagine that? Is that logically possible? I hope it's not stretching your imagination to suppose that I'm sometimes wearing shoes at night in January. Yeah? Okay. I know I'm really challenging you all right now, but here, here it is. It's, a, it's an argument with true premises and a true conclusion, but it fails to satisfy our definition of validity. Right? Just being true in both those cases is not enough to be valid. It's got to be that it's impossible, impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion is false. Here, it's totally possible for the premises to be true, but the conclusion is false. Yeah? Yeah. Bo has both, uh, have both premises. false premises. Yes. Uh, did I not? Oh, I thought I had an example. All right. So here's a valid argument with false. But the question was, can I give an example of a valid argument with false premises? Yes, I can. 
If I have six legs, then I am an Olympic athlete. I have six legs, therefore I am an Olympic athlete. Now, in reality, I have two legs and I'm a doughy 37-year-old academic. So neither of those premises are true. And the conclusion is also false. I am not a sporty type. So the premises are both false. The conclusion is false. However, if those two premises were true, then the conclusion would be necessarily true as well. If I have six legs, then I'm an Olympic athlete. I have six legs, therefore, I'm an Olympic athlete. So now we're going to talk about some weird kind of, they're almost like loopholes in the definition that I gave you. Uh, they're a bit odd, but I think they're worth focusing on because they highlight some of the features of the definition. And I really want you to get this definition of validity clear in your head because it'll, it will come up, all right? It will come up throughout the course. These, I'm, I'm calling them loopholes, but they're just facts about the definition. So two things. An argument with contradictory premises is automatically valid. And an argument with a conclusion that is true by definition is also automatically valid. And let me show you some examples of both of those. So on the left is just our definition of validity again. So you can refer to it. Now, here's an argument. Blue is the best color, premise one. Premise two, blue is not the best color. Therefore, the moon is a cube. OK. That is, by our definition, that is a valid argument. It's a valid argument. It's a bad argument. It's not a good argument. It's not an argument you should like or enjoy. You should not go home and tell your parents, today I learned that the moon is a cube. Right? But it's valid. And why? OK, so we got a two. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's, it's not possible for all the terms to be true. So it's not possible for all the terms to be true and the blue thing to be false. Perfect, perfect. So our definition of validity is, for those of you in the back, our definition of validity is it's not po an argument is valid if it's not possible for all of the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. Right? So it's a two parter. You're saying it's impossible that these two things happen at the same time. Now, both of those things have to happen at the same time for it to be invalid. If all the premises can never be true all at the same time, it's impossible for all the premises to be true at the same time, then you definitely don't get one half of it. And if you don't have one half of it, you definitely don't get both halves of it. Yeah? So it's automatically failed this two-part test. It's invalid if it's possible for premises to be true and conclusion to be false. Well, if the premises contradict each other, so these two premises, blue is the best color, blue is not the best color, clearly can never be true at the same time, right? They are contradictory. They contradict each other. Therefore, those two premises can never, it's impossible for those two premises to be true at the same time. Therefore, it's impossible for them to be true while the conclusion is false. Even though the conclusion is false, the conclusion is false, but because you can never satisfy that two-part definition of invalidity, you can never, this argument is automatically valid. Yeah? So you can prove that an argument is valid without even, in this weird case, I mean, it's a fairly weird case, but in this weird case, you can prove that the argument is uh, valid without even looking at the conclusion. So it does not matter what the conclusion was here. It, it could be anything. It's valid because the premises contradict each other. Okay. OK, uh, now let's do this in the, OK. And the same thing, so I didn't, I didn't put an example on the slides, but exact same thing if the co conclusion was itself a contradiction. Or sorry, is a tautology. So a tautology is something that's true by definition. So blue is a color. Do we agree that that's just like, if you just understand the words that I just said, you know that blue is a color? Is that, is that OK? So that, as a conclusion, suppose that's the conclusion of any argument. Blue is a color. What's well, impossible for that conclusion to be false, right? 
it's impossible for the conclusion that blue is a color to be false, because it's true by definition. So any argument that has that as the conclusion is automatically valid for just the opposite. I mean, it's the same reason, but flipped over, because you can never satisfy our two-part definition of invalidity, true, prem true premises, false conclusion. Yeah? OK. OK, so most of our time and energy is going to be spent doing uh, symbolizations, which show that you know how to connect this stuff up with language, and derivations, which are derivations or demonstrations that an argument is valid. So I showed you an example of a derivation last time. And a derivation is you start from the premises and you derive the conclusion and you show that they're thereby that it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Now, a little bit of our time at the end of the first section, just before the first test, we'll do some truth tables. And at the very end of the course, we'll do what are called invalidities and expansions. So that's going to be working on showing that something is invalid. We'll do that a little bit informally now. So I'm just going to do an informal version of the things that we'll do formally later on. Uh, but so that you, again, just we're just kind of exploring this definition of validity to really, to really nail it down. So one way to show that an argument is invalid and therefore not truth preserving is to describe a possible situation where the premises are true while the conclusion is false. So if you can think of some scenario, any scenario, it doesn't have to be a normal, sane scenario. It can be a wild, weird scenario where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then you've shown that that argument is invalid, that it's not truth preserving. OK. I mean, this one's not wild and wacky. This is a fairly banal one. But so the question is, is this a valid argument or isn't it? And what I want you to do is try to think of a scenario where the premises are both true and the conclusion is false. OK, so we need to make the conclusion false. If the conclusion's false, then you didn't have eggs and you didn't have juice, right? Is there some way that the first premise can be true? You got it? Cereal and coffee. If you had cereal, that makes the first premise true. So I either had eggs or cereal for breakfast. That's true if you had cereal. Yeah? Good? I either had juice or coffee with breakfast. That's true if you had coffee. Yeah? So we've just made it. So you got a breakfast, you had cereal and coffee. Now the conclusion is I had either eggs or juice. Suppose you had neither of those things. We've just come up with a scenario that shows that this argument is not a valid argument. Yeah? Because you imagine, now, does it matter what you actually had for breakfast? No. No. The actual scenario does not impact the validity of the argument at all. Suppose that you had eggs and juice for breakfast. Doesn't matter. The argument is still invalid because you can imagine a scenario where it's not valid, where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Yeah? So it's about the possibility space. An argument is only valid if it restricts the possibility space in a certain way. And here we've got a possibility that is true premises, false conclusion, therefore the argument is invalid. It's, it's really about the guarantee that the argument is presenting you. What you want for deductive validity is a certain kind of guarantee. You know, life does not present you many guarantees, but we'll see some here. They're kind of empty guarantees, but nonetheless. Okay, how about this one? Is this valid or is this invalid? So, 
for the conclusion to be false, it has to be the case that it is cloudy or it's hot. Or sorry, it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. Or it was cloudy or it was not hot, sorry. Ugh. Okay. What do you think? Valid or invalid? Yeah. Valid. Yeah. Excellent. So the, the, the answer is it is a valid argument because if that second premise is true, if it wasn't cloudy, then it's got to be true that either it wasn't cloudy or it was hot, right? The truth of the second premise guarantees the truth of the whole conclusion all by itself. So if both of those premises are true, then it's got to be the case that that conclusion is true as well. And that's our definition of validity. There's just no possible scenario you can imagine where both premises are completely true and the conclusion is false. Yeah? Okay. Valid or invalid? The reading was complicated and difficult. The reading was tedious. Therefore, the reading was complicated and tedious. By now, I think you should, be, you should be getting into the groove of this. Valid or invalid? Valid. Valid. If, so the first thing is a conjunction. It says this thing and that thing. And the conclusion is also a con conjunction. It says this thing and that thing. But if it's complicated and difficult, it's clearly complicated. And if it's complicated and premise two says it's tedious, then it's complicated and tedious. Right? There's no imaginable scenario where those premises are true and the conclusion is false. Good. OK, so that thing that we just did is not a thing that's going to appear on your tests, just, just to like, assure you that I'm not going to do that specific thing to you. Uh, it's a bit tricky. It's not clear what counts as possible. Um, and I, I say that with some degree. My, my PhD thesis was all about possibilities. So I say with some degree of confidence. And you could sum up the question I was answering with, what, is it, what does it mean to be possible? It took me 180 pages. Uh, so I assure you that it's not super straightforward to say what's possible, um, which is tricky and weird. And so we don't really want to deal with that. Let's not deal, let's not deal with that. Let's not deal with the tricky, weird question of, what is possible anyway? Let's, let's not. Instead, let's do the following. Let's try to strip away the content of arguments, the meaning and significance of the words that we're using, and try to reveal their form, the form of arguments. So let me show you what that is. OK. So. On the left is an argument you've seen, you've just seen. And it might have taken you a minute to kind of piece this out. Like, OK, is that valid? Is that invalid? Is there some scenario I can imagine where that's true premises and false conclusion? On the right is a logically equivalent argument. Right? It's got the same logical form. Now, as a matter of fact, my mom's name is Leslie. So it is true as an actual matter of fact, that either a frog or Leslie is my mother. One, one half of that is true, because my mother's name is Leslie, so Leslie is my mother. So it's true that either a frog or my mother is Leslie. It's a weird thing to say, but it's true. It's also true that either a cat or Leslie is my mother. Yeah? Is it therefore true that either a frog or a cat is my mother? I assure you it is not. OK. So either I had eggs or cereal for breakfast. I had either juice or cereal for breakfast. Therefore, I had either eggs or juice. Is similarly an invalid argument, because it's got the exact, and you can tell that, because we came up with a clearly invalid argument that has the same logical form as that one. OK. Now, to avoid the tedious work of coming up with weird 
mom-based analogies, uh, we're going to do the following. We're going to symbolize our arguments. So here on the right is, so suppose P is a frog is my mother, Q is Leslie is my mother, and R is a cat is my mother. OK? So on the right, we've got the basic logical form of the argument. And anything that has that logical form will be an invalid argument. So having shown that one instance of that form is invalid, we can now say anything with that form is invalid. OK? So we're going to deal with logical form. And that's really the whole rest of the course, is dealing with logical form. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of work to do translating sentences into their logical form. So that's the symbolization stuff we talked about on Monday. Symbolization is the skill of extracting the logical form from a sentence. So we'll talk about, there's like a, layers and layers of sort of degrees to which you can symbolize something, how deep into the structure you want to get. But that's the symbolization. So the symbolization skill is moving from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. Derivation is where we're going to learn how to analyze whether an argument is valid or not based on its form. So we'll largely do those two things separately. Mostly, I'm not going to make you symbolize something and then do the derivation. Mostly, I'm going to say, symbolize this, derive that. They won't be the same thing. But that's how these skills sort of are continuous with each other. OK, so a couple of conventions to, to get on the table right now. So we're going to represent sentences, but with the letters from P to Z. We've got other plans for the letters from A to O. That's why we're choosing P to Z. It'll come back later. The letters A to O, capital letters A to O, will have a different job later in the course. Right now, sentences are going to start from P to Z. More specifically, they're not just sentences. There's something more specific than that. They are propositions. Okay? This is a philosopher's term for a sentence that could be true or false. Okay, so lots of sentences are not propositions. Questions, for example. Questions are not true or false. So if I ask you, have you stopped, uh, have you stopped shooting heroin in the evenings? That's not a true or false statement, right? It's just kind of weird, right? You can ask a question, and no question has a truth value. It's just a question. Similarly, commands. If I say to you, sit down and shut up, that's not true or false. That's me telling you to do something, right? Again, aggressive, weird, lots of things you can say about that sentence. But it's not true or false. A proposition is something that asserts a fact about the world, right? My mom's name is Leslie. That's a thing that could be true or false, right? So it's a proposition. And in fact, propositions are the only things in the entire universe that can be true or false. There's nothing else. Propositions are statements of fact that are potentially true or false. So these letters, P to Z, we're going to use them to symbolize propositions. OK. To finish this class off, I just want to talk about very briefly about a few things that we're not going to be dealing with from here on in. So these are things that we're just going to ignore for the rest of the class. Uh, and you really, you don't have to worry about them. And I want to explicitly flag that you don't have to worry about them. So implicature. What's implicature? So suppose somebody says, everyone in the class other than Susan is doing well. Now, the implicature of that is that Susan is not doing well. It sounds like the only reason that you would leave out that information is if Susan isn't doing well. But that's logically consistent with Susan also doing well, right? Um, so what we do with language a lot of the time is make implications in, that aren't strictly logical uh, consequences of what we're saying. Another example would be if, uh, if Tom's boss, you and Tom work together, 
and Tom's boss asks you, hey, how's Tom doing at work? And you say, well, he's very punctual. The implicature of that is that there's nothing else nice that you have to say. Even if that's true, uh, that he's punctual, it may or may not be the case that uh, there are other good things that you could have said. So these are the kind of, you know, the, the things that we do with language when we understand meaning and context and all of that. And basically, we're going to ignore that for the rest of the semester. It's not going to be hard to ignore that. That's just not part of our system. So this is just sort of by way of saying goodbye to the subtle complexities of language and hello to just the sheer raw logical form of it all. Another thing that we're going to ignore is time. So we're not going to deal with the difference between it was the case that or it will be the case that or it will always be the case that. Um, <clears throat> there are logical systems that deal with this, so so-called temporal logic. Temporal logic includes as part of the form of the sentence whether something is in the past, present, or future. But that's more advanced than what we're going to do in this class. This class is really the most simple logical system that everybody sort of gets. And then we, you can, from here, you can branch out to more complex logics like temporal logic. But for us, this is not going to be a thing that we're going to consider. Similarly, vagueness. So many of the terms that we use in our language are vague. For example, raining. How hard does it actually have to be raining to say it's true that it is raining? Is one raindrop enough? Is one little drop of water enough to say that it's raining? What about, you know, a tiny little sprinkle? Um, there's just no clear line where you can draw to say, ah, now it's raining, but before it wasn't. <clears throat> and just the same, there's a famously there's vagueness in the predicate baldness, so the the or the property of being bald. So if somebody's lost a quarter of their hair, are they bald? Mm, not really. Uh, what about half? Mm, sort of. Um, and but if you there's no point where if you take one hair out of somebody's head, they go from not being bald to being bald. It's a vague property. Now, in our logical system, there's no room for vagueness. Things are either true or false. There are no other options. There's no sort of true or kind of true or a little bit true. We're not dealing with that at all. Again, there are logical systems in which we do deal with vagueness, so so-called fuzzy logics, where you can apply a truth value between true and false. So you can say it's half true or one quarter true, but again, these are more advanced logics. These are logics that we're not going to be working on in this class. So in this class, we're going to ignore vagueness, vagueness entirely. Finally, we're going to ignore, well, we're not so much going to ignore, but try to eliminate ambiguity. So here's Groucho Marx. One morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. Okay, so you thought that Groucho was in his pajamas and he shot an elephant but the elephant was in his pajamas. This is because the first, this, this insofar as this is a joke, uh, the, it's a joke because the first sentence is ambiguous. Uh, who's in the pajamas is the ambiguous part of that sentence, just to suck the last remaining joy out of this. Um, so in this class, it's not so much that we're going to ignore ambiguity, is that we're gonna actively try to eliminate it. We are going to hunt it down and shoot it like the proverbial elephant. We're going to try to symbolize sentences in an unambiguous way, such that we can evaluate them as either true or false in a clear and like uh, sort of like either one or the other sort of way. So ambiguity is one of the reasons why we want to learn this skill so that we can remove the ambiguity from the things that we're saying. In natural language, sentences are often ambiguous, but once we've logically formalized them, if we've done it right, then there's no longer any ambiguity about what you're saying. It's just very, very clear. So unlike the other two, we're not quite going to ignore ambiguity. We're going to try to eliminate it from the sentences we're dealing with. Okay, so that's it on things that we're going to ignore or eliminate. Um, there's no uh, graded exercises for this week. 
Uh, I would recommend that you try the following exercises. So chapter zero, section two, questions one through six, and chapter zero, section three, questions one and two. Um, try these. There are answers for most or many uh, or all of them in the at the end of the chapter. And if you have trouble, you can ask on Quirkus. So these are just good ways of reinforcing the stuff that we've talked about today about uh, validity and soundness and what those concepts really mean. Okay. So next time we'll do symbolizing condi conditionals and negation.